Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 8th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We discuss the operating budget as it has passed from House Finance, including how the FY25 PFD is being jerry-rigged by taking money from FY24. Second, we look at a timeline for Cook Inlet gas supply to explain why some concerns about the impact of LNG imports are being overblown. And third, we discuss an upcoming debate hosted by Alaska Common Ground on the PFD in which we are participating. And now let's join Michael. All right, well, we've got the weekly top three and I knew for sure that this was gonna be right at the top of your list. Uh, There was no doubt about it to me to look at the new budget and to see what was coming out. Uh, We are what, five weeks away from the six weeks away from the end of the session. And uh, we're still duking it out over certain things, but the house is finally House Finance, anyway, has finally put forth their budget. Um, there's going to be a lot of finagling on the floor, I'm sure. But uh, let's start off with number one, the House budget, the House Finance budget, as it sits right now. Hold don't, on. Don't, don't, don't sound too excited about this, Michael. Man, I just, you know, Brad, I'm starting to reach that. I'm just getting a little tired. It's like the, the same things that we fight. I mean, we've been fighting about this, you and I, together have been fighting about this for over 10 years and it's just it's painful man it's painful to watch people make this same don't stick your don't stick your finger in that light socket no no don't (laughs) stick your finger in that no do not stick your you did it again okay never mind it's just the same thing over and over uh anyway get uh, take it away brad bring bring on bring on the truth well this week uh we're gonna have the house budget the house finance budget on the floor and there's going to be lots of amendments and a lot of changes and and whatever I say today is going to be probably superseded, and I'll talk about it again next week after we get it off the floor. But uh, I do want to point out, I, I, I want to highlight a few things uh, about this budget as uh, as we're going through, um, as it came out of House Finance. The, the budget as it came out of House Finance uh, included, uh, according to Delena uh, Johnson, who Uh, made this statement, included about a hundred million dollar surplus, which means they didn't, which means they took about a hundred million dollars extra out of the PFD is basically what a surplus is, a hundred million dollar surplus. But it doesn't, this budget doesn't yet account uh, for uh, a number of things that we need to keep in mind before we say, yay, yay, they balanced the budget. For example, according to a story by James Brooks, that appeared in various papers throughout the state. The budget doesn't include the expected $40 million cost of a bill that increases internet speeds at rural schools. It doesn't include the $23 million cost of senior benefits, of the senior benefits bill that is also expected to become law. Uh, It doesn't include um, $20 million in K through 12 costs, additional K through 12 costs that that passed out of the uh, Senate or out of the House Education Committee yesterday. The Education Committee passed a a bill, uh, an education bill, a new K through 12 bill 
that included the six hundred and eighty million or six hundred and eighty dollars per student uh, additional amount that uh, that uh, is in the House bill, but it doesn't. The House Finance uh, budget doesn't include an additional twenty million dollars in K through twelve costs that were included uh, in the House Education Bill that came out of House Ed House uh, at the uh, House Education Committee. It doesn't include the capital budget, um, and so there's a lot of a lot of that hundred million dollars of, of of surplus uh, quickly disappears as uh, as as you start totaling uh, totaling those things up. In addition. Um, there were other things that were added to the bill as it was in the House Finance Committee. Uh, there were some subtractions. James uh, James's article notes that there were some subtractions. Quote, but even after those cuts, the budget left the House Finance Committee up by 59 million, rounding 60 million, when compared to the version the, the committee began with. So we have we had additions that occurred uh, during the House Finance Committee process. We have additions. Uh, yet to go, and we have uh, the capital budget yet to come over from the Senate, uh, yet to go. So we're a long way from finalizing this thing, and all of the pressure is up, right, going up. And does and that by, include? Does that? I just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but does that include the new education bill with another 175 million dollars in BSA and 47 million, roughly, I guess, is what the estimate was from from Andy Story. For the homeschooling contingent, does that include any of that? It includes the hundred and seventy. It includes one hundred seventy-five million for the for the BSA. That is okay. That right. that's in the House Finance Budget, but it doesn't include the additional amounts that were in the Education Committee that were passed by the Education Committee, which, according to the fiscal note, are about twenty million. There may have been there may have been some additional amount passed yesterday um, as a result that's not included in the fiscal note yet during the committee process. That's not included in the fiscal note yet. It won't include those additional amounts on top of the BSA that's, uh, that's in the house finance committee budget. So all the, all the pressure is going up, um, on the, on the budget. And we know what that means. We know that it comes out of the PFD. So we're, we are probably, uh, at the high watermark, uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, in the terms of the PFD, uh, of what we'll see coming out of House Finance Committee, I want to talk about the PFD, how the PFD got con is constructed for a moment. Also, do you have that chart? Uh, that I do. I, I sent you. The I I do, in fact, have that chart uh, that folks can take a look at here. So I, the House Finance Committee uh, PF, PFD. Uh, they touted uh, 2,200, uh, 2,300, 2,272 dollars uh, PFD. It's in the third or fourth column all over. It's in the column that's headed FY25 PFD HFIN. Um, and they've touted that number. But that number is really, it, it's it's constructed, sort of jerry-rigged. I mean, uh, uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of a PFD, you normally think, of the portion that's coming out of the, or the portion that's in the, in the current, the fiscal year we're talking about, this would be FY25. We're talking about the FY25 budget. So you normally think about the portion that's in the, that's, that's in the FY25 budget, but about $500 million of this, of the, of the $1.5 million uh, PFD that's in there, the $2,200 uh, PFD that's in there is coming out of FY24. And it's, it's it, it's interesting to go through how that how that's constructed. Uh, for 140 million of it is is what was already in the FY24 budget. If you'll recall, the FY24 budget uh, was developed in what what legislators called a waterfall fashion. That is, there was a certain budget for FY24, and then if there was a surplus in revenues, uh, those that surplus in revenues above. The amount that the budget provided for would go certain places, and uh, a certain amount of the of, of the revenues above uh, would go was to be split between the PFD uh, and the CBR, and then the amount beyond that uh, was to go into the CBR. Well, what what this budget does was count, and and those the amount that was supposed to go to the that's supposed to go to the PFD in the FY twenty four budget should be counted as part of the FY24 budget, a delayed payment on, on, the, on the FY24 
um, um, PFD, the amount that we got last year, should be counted toward that. But what this budget does is count that, that additional amount, that additional $140 million as part of the FY25 uh, PFD. Uh, it also then, then takes the other $140 million, the part that was supposed to go to the CBR, the part of the waterfall that was supposed to go to the CBR, and reappropriates that over to the FY25 PFD. So it essentially takes that money that was otherwise des otherwise designated for the CBR, pulls that back over to the FY25 PFD. And then there's an additional amount that again, under the, under the FY24 budget was supposed to go to the CBR, the surplus uh, remaining in the FY, if there is a surplus remaining in the FY24 budget, it pulls that out of FY24, pulls that out of otherwise going to the CBR and pulls that into the FY25. Uh, PFD. So the amount, only only roughly two thirds of the amount that's in the PFD that's been passed by House Finance um, comes from the FY25 budget. The remaining third of it, the remaining 500 million of it, comes from uh, comes from the FY24 budget, FY24 budget that they're pulling forward into F FY25. Um, and I've included, for reference, I've included what the statutory PFD would be, the FY25 statutory PFD, if we were following the law, to use Julie Clome's uh, words, if we were following the law, what that PFD would be, what a what a POMB 5050 PFD would be, and what a what we're likely going to hear from Senate Finance, what a POMB 2575 um, PFD is. But that 2272 is really jerry-rigged by pulling a lot of the money uh, out of FY24, redesignating some of the money out of FY24, uh, pulling the surplus out of FY24, uh, and then counting the FY24 supplemental additional PFD that, that was supposed to be paid in FY25, uh, counting that as also going to the FY25 PFD. That's not sustainable. So even if you even if you take at face value, what house finance what the house finance committee has done the pfd that they put in there is is jerry rigged out of a bunch of one time money um, and is not sustainable going forward I, I i highlight that because remember when this when this legislature got formed when the house majority caucus got for, formed their number one priority was to have a fiscal plan they were going to come up with a fiscal plan that was going to resolve all this we weren't going to have to debate it and it was going to be we were finally going to have a fiscal plan in place. The fiscal plan, their fiscal plan, as represented in their in the last budget, this House Finance Committee is going to produce. This legislature's House Finance, Com Finance Committee is going to produce. This the, the fiscal plan is as jerry rigged, is as pull from you know a variety of sources as we've ever done. So right. we, we we are no we are we are no further along in having a sustainable long-term fiscal plan uh, in place than we were when this, when this legislature started. And I yeah. think there's no, no better place to highlight that than in the, than in this PFD calculation. So what you're essentially saying is we're still making it up as we go along. I mean, that's essentially, you know, there is no plan plan. While I appreciate the fact that we're getting, you know, that, that they're attempting to get a larger PFD, the fact that they're going to short their payback to the CBR um, is problematic again, because we still owe the CBR $10 billion <laughs> and that bill has got to come due someday unless we amend the cost. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's insane. Uh, and no, again, long-term fiscal plan. This just shows it one more time that there is no long-term fiscal plan, uh, in that regards. And that is, a, I mean, that's a, that's a problem for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for, I'm sorry, Brad, go ahead. Final thoughts on no, that. No, no, it, 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 it is a problem. Um, I mean, we've, we've, we, we've had, we elected a majority that said they were going to, that they were going to go in there and develop a fiscal plan. And we've got nada. We got, we got nothing coming out of this. Uh, just uh, the same old Jerry rigged, uh, but you know, they went through this, this long debate about we can't borrow from the CBR. And then underneath the table, they borrowed from the CBR. They've taken from the CBR in order to fund the PFD.
well, and in this case, they haven't even borrowed. They haven't even bothered to borrow it. They just intercepted the money before it went into it, so they don't have to do the three quarters vote, right? I mean, it's uh, it, it's uh, it's a it's a workaround because if they put the money in the CBR, it requires a higher threshold. So now they're just going to, you know, intercept it on the way in. I mean, it's a plan. It's just not a. <laughs> It's not a great plan, all right? I mean, you know, again, I'm appreciative of the fact that they're trying to reach closer to a statutory PFD, but the machinations and the mental gymnastics they have to do to justify it, instead of just pulling the money out of the earnings reserve and showing this is where it's coming from and everything else has to justify its position, is, again, just shows, I think, the lack of belief in what the statute calls for personally i mean that's 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 oh, they're crazy. just they're just ignoring it michael i mean they're just they're just absolutely ignoring current law and and you know julie cologne says oh i want to follow the law but um well yeah i mean <laughs> you want to follow the law except you don't and and it's and it's really it, it's really disappointing after all of the talk they had about you know we're going to come up with a fiscal plan uh, all of that discussion, all of the claims they had, all of the focus they had establishing the Ways and Means Committee, putting Ben Carpenter in charge of the Ways and Means Committee, pulling him off House Finance, putting him in charge of that to focus on a fiscal plan. The Speaker, Kathy Tilton, going on that that committee to help focus on a fiscal plan, uh, having the chair of House Resources, Tom McKay, on the, on the Ways and Means Committee to focus on a fiscal plan. And then... You know, Ben comes up. I've I've got to give credit, continue to give credit to Ben Carpenter for coming up idea, coming up with ideas on how to develop a long term fiscal plan. But they couldn't even get it out of the Ways and Means Committee. They got drips and drabs out of it, and the only one that's really made it to the floor out of the drips and bra- drabs that got out is HJR seven, the constitutional amendment to constitutionalize the PFD, uh, and that's stuck now in limbo. Uh, on the floor it's being <laughs> it's being called up you know every session and then deferred to the next session uh at one point I, I guess ben thought he had 27 votes which is what it would need to pass the what the constitutional amendment would need to pass the house floor somewhere along the way he lost the votes but they're not they can't send it back to rules committee because they can't get 21 votes to send it back to the rules committee i i personally agree with that just keep it just keep it out there uh, but you know, it's, this, this is a legis this is a caucus that said, we're going to have a fiscal plan. And at the end of the day, the fiscal plan they've come up with is no different. You know, Rob Peter, Rob, Rob FY24, claim it's FY25 money. Um, and, uh, and that's how we're going to construct our PFD. It's no different than what we've had in other legislatures. No, uh, it's more complicated. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, it looks, I mean, I guess you have to admire the, you have to admire the wherewithal of the Senate to say, well, our fiscal plan is 2575. That's what it is right there. Uh, you know, OK. All right. That's a, that's a, that's a fiscal plan. I mean, I don't think it's a great one. But uh, again, we keep missing we keep missing the long term impacts of this. This is, the, again, going back to Alaskans for sustainable budget, the sustainability. How long can you continue on on any of these plans. I mean, let's just say the 2575 plan. How long can you continue on that at the current growth rate of government before that plan is I mean, another 2 years maybe? Mm-hmm. Maybe <laughs> another 2 years? It, it, it's not a long-term plan. It's not really a plan, it's a wish. I mean, at this point yeah, it is. Um, it, it probably two, three years sort of depends on oil prices since we since we take a projection of oil prices and construct a budget on that. Uh, it depends on oil prices and um, and depends on production levels. I mean, we've talked on the show that that the legacy production fields uh, are going down faster than we than than the forecasts have predicted them going to go down. We've got new fields coming on, but if the legacy fields keep diving down, uh, at this rate, the new fields are just sort of going to re- just sort of going to replace those. They're not going to add to them. So, yeah. Well, there is no sustainability element of any of this because it's not sustainable. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and unfortunately, Alaskans just don't care. 
I mean, it's just, it's just kind of the bottom line because they keep sending the same group of folks back over and over again. Let's uh, go back over to Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, number two of the weekly top three. Now we're back to the issue of the Cook Inlet. Uh, it seems like every week we revisit part of this, at least, Brad. Uh, this is the hot and heavy issue. Uh, the legislature hasn't made many moves, although I know that you've testified and talked to them. What uh, give us the latest and greatest in your thoughts on what's going on with Cook Inlet Gas? Well, there's a the thing that triggered this is there's an article. There is a lot of movement going on. There's a lot of bills being talked about. A lot of a lot of effort at trying to come up with a plan. Oh no, an energy plan. Uh, trying to come up with a plan for how to deal with uh, with the shortfalls in gas supplies that are predicted in the Cook Inlet. And uh, Sean McGuire's done a fairly good job of capturing that in an article in the ADN a couple of days ago. The headline is Rail Belt Utilities Move Closer to Decisions on Importing Natural Gas as Legislators Debate uh, Energy Bills. I've been trying to come up with a way that, that, that does a better job maybe of explaining what we're facing than, uh, than I've done or, or maybe others have done. Uh, in uh, in the in the recent past, so that people can get a better grasp on what's going on. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, a lot of, to some degree, fear mongering going on about LNG imports, uh, because oh no, the price is going to be higher and prices are going to explode, and you know how can how can we ever stand that? That's not what's going to go on. So I've I've tried to put together a chart. This will probably be the chart of the week uh, for the landmine this week, but you get sort of a little preview of it here. Uh, I tried to put together a chart that that shows what's going on. This chart uh, shows uh, the Cook Inlet supplies and the seventy billion across the top. That's that's BCF on the left hand on the left hand axis. That's billion cubic feet. Uh, this shows a line across the top at seventy BCF. That's the size of the market uh, that uh, that most have assumed uh, in, in the in the course of these discussions. Uh, the dark blue bars that go up to the 70 BCF in the early years, the, the across the bottom axis, axis is years, uh, the horizontal axis is years, and then I'll talk about the right vertical axis here in a moment. But, and for those of you, for those of you on the radio, it goes from zero to 80 million BCF, and the years go from 2024 all the way out to 2040. So you have kind of an idea of the time frame Brad's going to be talking about here. It's hard when you're on radio and you can't see the chart. I understand. Yep. You can go back and watch it uh, later on. Yeah, exactly. Or you can read the landmine column on Friday. But but uh, uh, across the top is a seventy is a is a straight line that's a seventy BCF. That's the size of the Cook Inlet market. The dark blue bars represent traditional Cook Inlet supplies, Cook Inlet gas supplies from uh, from Cook Inlet fields. These numbers are taken from uh, the analysis that was done last year by the Alaska Utilities Working Group. Uh, the phase one assessment of Cook Inlet gas supply. It was all the utilities working together along with consultants trying to figure out what was going on in the Cook Inlet. So the dark blue bars are the supplies that are coming from Cook Inlet supplies. And they show that Cook Inlet, traditional Cook Inlet supplies meet demand through 2027, uh, 24, 25, 26, and 27, that we have 70 billion a day of production coming from, uh, from traditional Cook Inlet gas supplies. In 2028, the dark blue bar doesn't reach all the way to 70. It reaches to 62. And then I've got, then there's a red bar between that, the end of that, and the 70 that shows eight in red. That's the diff, that's the shortfall in supplies from the traditional Cook Inlet sources. And then that bar, the red bar increases over time. But the blue bar doesn't go away. The blue bar decreases over time as traditional Cook Inlet supplies are projected to decline, according to uh, ac according to the utilities analysis. Um, the red bars grow, but they don't suddenly replace the blue bars. So when we talk about LNG or when we talk about the shortfall, we're not talking about all of a sudden traditional Cook, in cook Inlet supplies stop and we have to replace the whole 70 BCF with another another source of supply. We're talking about like oil fields do, oil and gas fields do. We're talking about a gradual decline um, in existing production and the need for a gradual replacement in that production as we go along. 
there's a there's a couple of things about that. One, it it, it doesn't it it means that we don't have to go out and import a bunch of LNG all at once to replace uh, to replace decli- uh, cook inlet production because that the cook inlet production is gradually declining. We have to find a gradual replacement for that gradual decline. And it also means the effect on price is not as great as as I think some have some have led themselves to believe. So, for example, as the cook inlet supply, traditional cook inlet supply declines, it'll be priced as pursuant to the current contracts that cover it, and it will be priced at the same sort of rate that price that we have seen over the last uh, several years. Some have used the 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 the, the number eight uh, eight dollars of uh, MCF. Some have used nine, but somewhere in that range. And as the as the LNG supplies come in, they will be priced higher. But they'll be blended with that with that Cook Inlet supply, and so the impact on price will be very small at, at the beginning. It will grow gradually over time. It won't be just a sudden bam uh, uh, influx of uh, I- influx of uh, of additional uh, right. uh, uh, sp- spike in price. Right. Uh, so in three years, my du- my oil pro- my get my heating prices are not going to double in one year, right? It's not going to be next year. It drops off. It's like uh, by 2028, you know, it'll be only eight, eight uh, BCF that's required to be filled by 20 out of 70. Yeah. By 25, uh, 2035, that'll be, you know, 42 uh, of, of the 70 will have to be brought from offshore. So it'll be higher then, but it's a gradual is what you're saying. It's a gradual thing throughout from now till 2040. Right, we're going to e we're going to ease into ease into this adjustment to a different supply mix um, uh, coming out of the uh, coming out of the Cook Inlet. the The yellow bars at the bottom. Um, there's yellow bars at the bottom for those on on the radio, and they show the number of LNG tankers it will take to supply that uh, that difference that shortfall. Uh, in in the various years um, leading up to leading to the end of the chart uh, by 2040, so only two tankers, two tankers worth. I'll talk about that in just a second, but two tankers worth in 2028, uh, four tankers worth in 2029, uh, five tankers worth in 2030, and so on to 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 supply that the the portion that's in red as this gradually builds up. So all we're not going to suddenly see. You know, a bunch of LNG tankers go up that that show up in the cook inlet. That's going to be gradual. Also, here's the issue that 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 we ought to be focusing on. What what the what the utilities are telling us now is they can't have long the long term facilities for LNG the the facilities that are necessary to accommodate long term LNG in place until 2030 or maybe 2031. So we've got a we've got a shortfall that starts in 2028, a small shortfall in 2028 that builds over time. And what we really are should be focusing on, what the what the Alaska Public, uh, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, which regulates utilities, the Department of Natural Resources, which oversees Cook Inlet production in the legislature, what we really ought to be focusing on are the years 2028, 2029, and 2030 uh, which are the years before we can have long-term LNG in place. And that shortfall is 8, uh, eight BCF in 2028, 14 BCF in 2029, uh, 16 BCF uh, in 2030. Numbers, I mean, they're significant numbers, but they're not huge numbers that, uh, that I think some people have, uh, have, have gotten in their mind. John Sims uh, has talked about how to, how, and others, a lot of others, have talked about how to meet that shortfall. John says there is an LNG option, a short-term LNG option to meet that shortfall as well, but it's more expensive than the long-term option. But keep in mind that we're only talking about a fraction of the total demand that we have to meet through that short-term option uh, over those years. So even though it may be more expensive than the long-term LNG option, it's going to be blended in that the cost of that is going to be blended in with a still a lot of cook inlet production. And so the impact of, of that short term option, if we use go to short term LNG, the impact of that option is not going to be is not going to be huge 
uh, on uh, on the overall price because we're blending it in. It's only a fraction uh, of the overall production. One other thing that I that I want to say while I'm focused on this, um, what we're talking about in the legislature with some of the relief bills, uh, royalty relief or bringing in, you know, lending the producers money to bring in a rig, that sort of stuff. That is that that would have a longer impact than than that than the short term than the short term that we're talking about before we can get LNG in, and and as as the as the analysis as the Cook Inland analysis shows, that may be at a much higher price than LNG. Doing that, taking those steps for Cook Inlet production, additional incremental Cook Inlet production, may be at a much higher price than the LNG option. So I'm concerned about taking steps now that would that would have long-term impacts in terms of increasing the price of Cook Inlet production when we know we're going to have when we know we can have an LNG option by 20 a long-term LNG option by 20 by 2031. So I this chart is intended to try to help us better understand uh, I think what we're facing. We're not facing this huge crash, this huge loss of supply that has to all of a sudden be replaced by by long-term LNG, um, higher price, higher than current price, long-term LNG. We're facing a gradual decline in tradition in legacy Cook Inlet sources that would result in a gradual growth uh, of LNG deliveries. And even by 2040, uh, we still have Cook Inlet production um, uh, according to the according to the utilities analysis. Now more than half of the supply would be coming by LNG at that point, but we still have Cook Inlet production. And, and if we have, as, as I anticipate we would have, as additional LNG comes in, we may have additional Cook Inlet production come on, price responsive uh, Cook Inlet production come on. And so it may uh, in, extend the legacy line uh, uh, even further. So this just puts it into perspective, talking about the, you know, it's not quite the immediacy that we keep hearing about from other sources, right? I mean, that's the that's the bottom line here. It's not quite the immediacy level that we keep hearing about from the media, maybe, or Sims, or even the legislature. There is, I mean, there is an issue, but it's going to be a gradual, not an immediate, your price is going to double tomorrow. Exactly right, Michael. Exactly right. It's not a... It's, it, it's not a prices you're going to double tomorrow situation. It is it is a gradual incorporation of of supplies from new sources uh, to meet shortfalls in Cook Inlet production. But but Cook Inlet production is not falling off the shelf. It's not it's not going away. Uh, the utilities right. analyze that it's going to it's just going to gradually decline. I mean, your chart does not even like you said does not even take into account any new discoveries or any increased production in the Cook Inlet. And I mean, we're talking about a 15 year period. There definitely could be something that happens between now and then that makes a change. You know, and as, as you said, as the price increases, it may become more financially uh, appetizing for some of these co companies to do some more exploration and do some more drilling and, and expansion in the Cook Inlet. Right. Yep. Exactly right, Michael. And I think it also shows. I think it also shows the an advantage of of imported LNG as our as our marginal source of supply. We can imported LNG is going to be brought up in in cargoes, right? We don't have to take all the cargoes. I mean, globally, uh, there's a lot of times when Japan doesn't take cargoes of LNG, or or Europe doesn't take cargo of cargoes of LNG. They they float depending upon demand, depending upon their other sources of supply, uh, and depending upon uh, depending upon the demand. So it's not been cold in Europe this year. They've not taken as much LNG as, uh, as they previously anticipated. Same thing would occur here. I mean, we, we can forego cargoes or we can, we can cut back on cargoes of LNG if there's additional cook inlet supply uh, available. It's flexible. If we do things like, like Jesse Sumner has proposed, and build, you know, sort of regardless of the cost, build the big line down from the Cook Inlet. Uh, we've got all that infrastructure in place, hugely expensive infrastructure, and we pretty much bought into, you know, replacing Cook Inlet over the long term. There's really not going to be a whole lot of a whole lot of room for additional Cook Inlet production, but LNG gives us the flexibility. Um, imported LNG connecting 
connecting Alaska to global markets is really what we're talking about. Gives us the flexibility uh, to uh, to vary the amount that we're bringing in uh, if if there are additional discoveries in the cooking there. Right. Rob uh, Meyer says the benefit to LNG imports is they can be turned off. The other option options don't have that is what he's essentially saying. Yeah, exactly right. So it's so I know there's a lot of con- I know there's a lot of concern, a lot of fear, a lot of pride involved in bringing in imported LNG, but it's not it's not that, that big a deal. I mean, it, it's like discovering another field someplace else that we can connect to 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 South Central Alaska. I mean, the lower 48, you have, you know, Chicago. Chicago for a long time was dependent on fields out in Kansas and out in uh, and out in the, uh, the Texas panhandle. But, you know, as those fields declined, Chicago got connected to other fields uh, from uh, from the Gulf Coast, from from the Gulf of Mexico or from Louisiana or from other sources of supply. All that's happening here is as is as the Cook Inlet declines. We're connecting South Central to other global sources uh, of supply uh, through LNG. And Rob's exactly right. We can turn them down, turn them off if uh, if the Cook Inlet has uh, has additional sources of supply. Come on, come, come on. It's not it's not it's not a huge deal. And and the, and the fear mongering that 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 I've heard from some about, oh, my God, it's going to explode the price tomorrow just isn't true. Uh, it's going to be a gradual, uh, a gradual phase in even in the worst case, it's going to be a gradual phase in of, uh, of these global supplies. Well, prognosticate for me then. Why, why, the, why the doom and gloom talk? Is it, uh, is it because uh, it's a crisis and it allows some things to change? Or what, I mean, what, do you, what do you think here? Well, there are some Cook Inlet producers that want to produce gas that haven't been able to make their economics work. Um, and they see this as, an, I mean, we talked about this last week. They see this as an opportunity to say, oh my gosh, the sky's falling, but we have gas. Our economics don't work, but we have gas. Uh, and if you just allow us, if you just, uh, you know, waive our royalty obligations to the state, uh, or if you subsidize us in terms of bringing in additional rigs, we'll get gas for you. But 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 you've got to look at the cost of those additional supplies from the Cook Inlet. Cook Inlet can be expensive. Just like just like other places can be expensive, and you've got to look at what the lowest cost uh, source is. And I and I think you know some of those producers understand they may not be able to to be the lowest cost source of supply without some sort of state subsidy. So they're using this as an opportunity, you know, sort of pitching it on the back of Alaska pride. You know, we we got Cook Inlet gas. Just just give us money, and we'll get you Cook Inlet gas. Right. Sort of using that as 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 an opportunity to to get their <clears throat> otherwise uneconomic projects uh, in the door. Can we store it? Brian asks. Like, if we get a really good deal, I mean, that's the problem is we don't have any long term storage, right? In that regard, there's a lot of focus right now on developing additional storage. Singza, which is the Cook Inlet natural gas storage. Uh, 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 facility uh, is being expanded there. People are looking at the Beluga field over on the West side as, as, as a potential storage opportunity. There's a lot of storage potential. And so people for that very reason, people are looking at increasing storage to be able to accommodate um, uh, additional, uh, additional opportunities or good market opportunities. Welcome back to the program, the Michael Duke show. Common Sense Radio. Brad Keithley is our guest. The weekly top three continues. We're on to number three. Brad has accepted an invitation to debate on the PFD. Brad, give us a give us the lowdown here. What are we talking about? Well, Alaska Common Ground uh, has put together a program on the PFD. They've they've we they've done a few of these over the years. I guess they figured that it was time to do another. And there's a debate scheduled for Thursday night at the Palmer Railroad Depot. But it's going to be live streamed as well. So if people want to want to watch, what they've done is it, it's it's a pretty good concept. Uh, they're going to have Alexi Painter from uh, from Legislative Finance come in and sort of set the groundwork for you know why we're talking about PFD cuts in the first place or why we're talking about the PFD uh, in the first place. It's going to be moderated by Gunnar Knapp from ICER, uh, which I think is uh, is a good thing, and by uh, Tom Hewitt, who's the editorial writer for uh, for the oh, I was going to use Binkley family blog but I'll I'll use ADN uh, uh, in this the Anchorage Daily News in uh, in this in this context 
Uh, it's going to be moderated by those two. And they're going to have three panelists. Uh, when the invitations initially went out, <laughs> it was sort of like, it was sort of like the, uh, the, the, the three pigs. It was, it was going to be uh, big, the big PFD, moderate PFD and no PFD uh, basically was, were the positions that sort of moderated over time. But, uh, but the three panelists are Angela Rodell, former uh, department of revenue uh, commissioner, former head of the permanent fund corporation, Angela Rodell speaking in favor of essentially no PFD sort of taking Natasha's uh, role as uh, as the leftover PFD. Larry personally <laughs> being the moderate that, that, that's that makes me chuckle. Really? Larry, per Larry personally being wow. the moderate saying, you know, well, we ought, we ought to have some PFD, but not not the statutory PFD. And, and he's taking the moderate role. And I have been tagged with the with the label of being the big PFD, which I which I interpret as the Hammond PFD, <laughs> uh, the Hammond PFD uh, role. So they've got the, the panel. The, they've set it up to have six questions that they're going to ask the panelists. We each have a whopping two minutes. <laughs> to answer answer each of the questions each panelist has two minutes to answer each question and then the moderators can ask uh, can ask follow-up questions uh, uh from that and have some discussion about each of the uh each of the six issues so six six questions that they raise so it it promises to be interesting uh, uh in terms of sort of identifying the different positions out there A angela is interesting to have her step into Natasha's shoes to be the, to be the leftover PFD person. But it, it promises to be an interesting debate. Uh, at, at least Larry and Angela are certainly well-versed in these issues. I sort of think I'm well-versed in this issue. So, so it, it ought to be an interesting, ought to, ought to be an interesting discussion and having Gunner there uh, from the ICER standpoint, remember Gunner was the lead on the 2016 ICER study of uh, of the various of the impact of various options on solving the budget equation um having uh, having a uh, gunner there as a as a uh, co-host i think will add some uh, some sort of truth serum to right. uh, to, right. to some to some of the discussion well i find it interesting that you're being painted as the big pfd guy with only with the hammond option instead of i mean there is no statutory pfd guy being listed in this debate right i mean that's the thing that's that's what's getting me is that the label now is that the hammond pfd at 50 50 is the big enormous pfd yeah exactly right i mean larry larry wrote a column wrote an op-ed in the that was in the adn this week uh or last week rather it says when it comes to the pfd alaska has too many cooks in the kitchen and and as he's consistently done over time Larry doesn't admit that there are other alternatives for resolving for resolving this issue. Um, alternative revenues uh, for for resolving this issue. Alternatives that have a lower impact on the Alaska economy have a lower impact on eighty percent of Alaska families, middle and lower income. He doesn't even admit those exist. So at least during the, at least in these columns, he hasn't admitted it exists. So at least during these discussions, we will have some discussion. I'll at least try to generate some discussion about, about those other alternatives and why uh, he and Angela are not focused uh, on those other alternatives since they have a better impact on the Alaska economy and since they have a better impact on 80% of Alaska families. I suspect he's going to say it's because, well, they're not politically not politically realistic. The The interesting thing about this panel, Michael, um, and the interesting thing about the moderators and everybody involved, everybody's in the top 20%. All three panelists are in the top 20%. The moderators are in the top 20%. Alexi's in the top 20%. Everybody participating is in the top 20%. So everybody's sitting there going, hey, it doesn't affect me much. Why Why the hell do I care about uh, about how we resolve this problem? Let's just cut the PFD. We don't have, I mean, I'm going to be the voice, I think, of, uh, of, of what Governor Dunleavy was talking about in his state of the state about, you know, the, 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 the hardworking Alaska families that, that, you know, don't have time to get involved in these political debates. Well, and no audience participation in this debate, right? So they got six preset questions plus whatever Gunner or Tom Hewitt feel like asking. So it's not like they're going to be taking questions from the audience with the other 80% of the people would be like, um, 
hey, I'd really like to get my share of, you know, you're not going to see a lot of that. So, yeah, you're going to have to be the uh, you're going to have to be the uh, uh, the answer man or the or the, the I guess the voice for those people for sure. And then Donna just said, and, Ka- and Angela Rodell is now working for Kathy Geisel. So, <laughs> oh, God. yeah, I, sus- I suspect that's why she drew the short straw. It, it was interesting. Uh, originally, uh, it was supposed to be uh, the original concept was Natasha was going to take Natasha's role. Um, uh, uh, but but Natasha was unavailable. Then Al Bolay was going to take Natasha's role and he was unavailable. So. I don't, I don't, I'm sure they are unavailable, but I, but I find it interesting that it sort of devolves down to, uh, Angela, um, who probably, you know, may have gotten suggested by Giesel to go do it. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's going to be, I'm looking forward to it in the sense that none of us are going to be able to, to skate, you know, you know, sort of like I sort of like sometimes, some people feel I do on this show. I talk about an issue from one side and I don't have to confront the other side of it. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to, to have it in a forum where at least in theory, nobody's going to be able to do that. Gunner and Hewitt are going to be able to, you know, call uh, call checks on that. So we'll, I we'll see so. how it goes. Although we know Hewitt's position on this already as the editorial, editorial board, we already kind of know where he's positioned on it. So it's not like you're going to get... Uh, you're not like you're going to get much help from that quarter anyway. And yeah, maybe Natasha just couldn't find anything to, uh, maybe Natasha just couldn't find anything to wear, uh, for the, <laughs> that's why it was, you know, cause she's so sick of her clothes. Um, all right, Brad. So that's going to be this Thursday at, uh, where and where are people going to be able to view it at six o'clock, uh, at the, uh, at the Palmer railroad depot. If you want to see it, uh, see it live, Alaska common ground to their credit is, uh, is sort of, They've usually done Anchorage centered events. This one they're going to go up in the valley to do. Um, and you can find information about it, how to connect and how to watch the video and, and connect into it real time uh, at uh, the Alaska Common Ground website. It's Alaska, it's AK Common Ground, all one word, dot org uh, is, their, is their website. And then just click on events and it will take you to uh, the, the, this event's called the Future of the PFD. So I, I, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a good discussion of the issue. And, uh, and I, think, uh, I think those who are interested in the PFD and sort of interested in an exposition of the various, of the various positions on the, on the PFD ought to, ought to tune in. Well, because I think we can, <clears throat> I can say without much fear of correction that the Persili and Rodell uh, positions will be the positions of our elected officials for the most part. I, I think that's going to, you, you're going to see that answer there. Uh, and hopefully Brad can bring, you know, try and bring some common sense to that, but it's going to be, well, it'll be interesting. We'll see all the reasons why the legislators will be doing the things that they do. And all those answers will be coming from Rodell and uh, Priscilla at this point. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be channeling Ben, uh, Ben Carpenter to a degree. Cause I mean, they're going to say, they're going to say, "Oh, it's just not politically realistic to, to you know, have uh, have other methods of, of of revenues." And I'll say, "Look, even Republicans are stepping out there. Even conservative Republicans are stepping out there, and proposing it. The real problem is on the Democrat independent side. They don't they don't want taxes taxes, uh, uh, transparent taxes, because they're afraid of what that's going to do to spending. They're afraid people are going to start pushing back on spending. So we'll have that discussion." All right, Thursday, 6 p.m., akcommonground.org, if you want to get more details on it. Wow. So shocking to me that the 50-50 PFD is now the enormous PFD, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the that's the verbiage they'll be using. This gigantic, this huge, this unrealistic PFD is now the 50. The 50, the goalposts have moved. Was the statutory PFD, oh, we're willing to meet in the middle. Oh, no, now you got to meet us here at 10% PFD. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of thing. And so now the 50, 50 has become the, the huge PFD at this point. It's, it's just astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Well, we're going to hear a lot about, Oh, we won't have enough money through K for K, K through 12. We're going to hear, you know, we won't have enough money for, you know, roads. We won't have a m- enough money for this, that, and the other thing we can't pay out this PFD. Of course we'll have enough money for K through 12. Of course we'll have enough money for, for, for roads. You just got to raise it honestly. 
You've got to raise it transparently. You've got to what raise it in a way that has a low impact on the Alaska economy. And you've got to raise it in a way that includes the top 20% non-residents and the, and the oil companies, a broad, a broad base to, to contribute to, uh, contribute to these things. And I'm going to, I'm going to be interested in what the reaction to that is. The first reaction is going to be, Oh, that's not politically feasible, but, but hopefully the moderators will push through that and say, well, let's assume for the moment that it is politically feasible. What's wrong with that? And they're going to have to admit, I think they're going to have to say that, well, you know, Alaskans might push back because they don't want to pay for that stuff. As long as it's hidden, to use the Milton Friedman, Friedman right. analogy, as, as long as it's hidden, you know, we get away with a bunch of stuff. But gosh, we have to put it out there and make it and make it, you know, transparent. We may not be able to get away with all that stuff. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, and that's that's the whole point at this point. Uh, people may not want to pay for it. Shock, the gasp. Well, maybe they, then maybe again, the question of who pays needs to be the most important question of any of those that are asked uh, this Thursday or at any time. I mean, thank God people are, start, you know, some of the people in the legislature are at least asking, OK, who pays for that? I mean, who pays for that? Then? You know, wh where does that come from? Where does that money? Where do you drag it up from? And it can't just be the PFD, because, again, that's a diminishing pot of money. And in just a couple of years with your 2575 plan, what's going to what's going to happen there? Uh, there won't be anything left and uh, nobody's willing to uh, nobody's willing to 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 bring that up. I, I've got to I got to give some recognition to Representative Allard uh, in the Education Committee yesterday when when various rep, when various representatives on the Democrat side or on the independent side brought up additional spending, additional K through 12 spending. They wanted to increase the BSA or they wanted to do various other things that increase spending. Representative Allard, Chair Allard, uh, uh, asked, asked a very, asked the important question. Does that mean you want to cut the PFD to do it? And all of a sudden there was this, you know, this ruffling and, 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 oh, my, that's not, that's not for us to decide. That's the finance committee. Don't ask us those questions. That's the finance committee that has to address those questions. But no, if you're going to bring, if you as a representative are going to bring up additional spending. You need to be able to defend where it's coming from. You need to be able to articulate where you have in mind it coming from and why it's more important to spend than it than 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 the impact of, of taking that money out of the economy through the way through the way that you propose. And and they 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 didn't want to answer the question. They you know just sort of shifted around and said, oh, that's the finance committee. Don't ask us that question. But I've got to give I got to give credit to Jamie for 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 bringing up that question and 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 asking them directly when they when they brought up uh, uh, the pro their proposed amendments for increased spending where the money was going to come from. Yeah, no, I mean again the question of who pays is definitely important. Um, this is a comment from a back in the day here uh, earlier in the program all those years ago. Um, when Kevin mis uh, mentioned, uh, Brad said HDR seven, but the companion bill HB one ten passed out of ways and means will be instrumental in getting HJR seven moving. I'm not familiar enough with HB 10, 110 to, to address that, but do, are you familiar with it, Brad? You want to comment on that before I let you go? No, I'm going to have to go read HB, HB 110. It's, um, I'm not, maybe that's the sales tax bill. I mean, the big issue with HJR seven has been, has been the pushback that I've heard has been, well, we passed that and all of a sudden, you know, now we've got, now we've got the PFD constitutionalized or the, the current statute constitutionalized. There will be no additional revenues. The conservatives will refuse to give additional revenues. And so we'll have to make these big spending cuts. And, and that's, that's where I understand the, the stumbling block has been to get to 27. So maybe HB 110. 110 is the sales tax bill, then sales tax bill. Maybe that, uh, maybe that's what it is. Maybe something else. I'll go, I'll go look at it, but that'd be okay. great. I mean, if there's a way of getting HJR seven moving, that would be great. Yeah. Getting it across the finish line would at least take care of one thing, uh, in the nine point fiscal plan. Now we just got to worry about the eight other things that need to be, uh, put in there and, uh, and carried across. Uh, to have an actual fiscal plan. I mean, again, it's ironic. You pointed out earlier, this was the whole point of the majority and the formation and the discussion and so much work and energy has gone into it. And yet 
here we are still <laughs> with no fiscal plan uh, of any way. And the only thing that did make it across the finish line at, in any way outside of HDR seven was of course the cap, which was then hijacked uh, by other people and uh, you know, made totally moot at that point. And uh, which I, I found frustratingly disingenuous in my opinion, in many ways, but uh, anyway, uh, okay, Brad, um, any final thoughts here? We're down to the last minute. No, Michael, I, I think, uh, I think we've talked, talked it all around. Um, I, I do encourage, and, and thank you, Kevin, for the, for the reference to H, HB 110. I'll go look at that in advance of the debate on uh, Thursday. All right. Thank you, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. We appreciate it, my friend. We will see you again next week. It's all going to be good. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, Michael. Thanks for having me. As always, we look forward to it too. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.